Hello and welcome to World Inside. I'm Tian Wei in Beijing. Today we bring you an edition on interviews with brilliant minds in the global medical research world. First up, Richard Horton, the editor in chief of Lancet. The Lancet, the weekly peer reviewed general medical journal, is among the world's oldest and best well known scientific publications. Ever since the outbreak of the COVID 19 pandemic, it has been publishing research and review articles on the study of the coronavirus. It also has a COVID 19 resource center, including all latest comments, correspondence, and articles on the pandemic. Richard Horton studied medicine in Britain. In 1990, he became the assistant editor of The Lancet and five years later, the editor-in-chief. Recently, he published a book, The COVID-19 Catastrophe, What Went Wrong and How to Stop It Happening Again. With his lifelong study of medicine and decades of experience at The Lancet, what is his prognosis and what should we do to cope with the new reality? I ask him directly. And we are joined by Richard Horton, who is the editor-in-chief of The Lancet, one of the world's most influential medical journals. Uh, Mr. Horton, what a pleasure to see you finally. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you, sir. If I ask you to give your grade about the world's performance against COVID-19 since the beginning of it until now, one to a hundred, what mark would you give? Uh, I would give uh, the result well below 50, I'm afraid. Uh, I'm a, I don't think the world has responded well at all to the pandemic. The world was not prepared. And despite the warnings that, in fact, your country sent in the final week of January through the papers that we had the privilege of publishing, uh, I'm afraid that the world did not pay attention to those warnings, and that is why we are in the desperate situation we're in today. Did you realize, Mr. Horton, what you have just said are almost totally in a different logic against some of the rhetorics that are quite popular in the West, suggesting China is the problem, and China did not give the warning, WHO did not act, and therefore all the other countries failed, especially the United States. So you are saying they're wrong? They're completely wrong, and there is a radical rewriting of history taking place right now in the West. And we need to keep emphasizing the truth. And the truth is that on December the 31st, China informed the World Health Organization about an outbreak of a new disease. Immediately, within 48 hours, the World Health Organization appointed a team to investigate this new outbreak. The genome was sequenced early in January, and by the last week of January, Chinese scientists had declared to the world that this was indeed a new disease, a very severe disease for which there was no treatment, for which patients were being admitted to hospital and many were dying that there was human-to-human -human transmission and that there was a risk of a global pandemic. Mm -hmm. All of that information was made available to the world by Chinese scientists, not by Western scientists. But Western governments chose to ignore those warnings, and that is why we now see this epidemic burning through other countries in the world. But you know, others would just say, we do not care. What we know is you are the problem, China is the problem, WHO is the problem, and that's why we are here. And we do not want to wear masks, and we do not want to do anything extra than we have already done. So, you know, Mr. Horton, no matter what you talk about, WHO, no matter what warning you give, we're just going to go our way. Well, China is not the problem, and WHO is not the problem. Um, the problem is that Western government, governments were not prepared for this pandemic. And I think with the fullness of time, the truth will be made very clear that we actually owe, an, owe a debt of gratitude to Chinese doctors and scientists who worked out the threat of this pandemic all those months ago. Mm. I think the truth will be clear. It will take some time. 
we're going through a very strange period of geopolitical instability at the moment. And my view is that Western governments are choosing to blame the World Health Organization and China rather than accept their responsibility for the way they have handled their own epidemics. Mm. But the question really now, Mr. Horton, is we want to save lives, don't we? What kinds of investigation are we talking about? Can we do two things at the same time, Mr. Horton? On the one hand, to look into the origin and the scientific issues related to it. On the other hand, to work on the already collapsing geopolitics and come up with some kinds of mechanism. Yeah, no, I, I, we can do all of that. Um, the first thing we have to do is we have to get a grip on the pandemic. We still have 200,000 cases a day being diagnosed with 5,000 deaths a day across the world. Uh, it's a multipolar pandemic. The main focus at the moment is Brazil, the United States, uh, and India. And we need to control this community transmission. That means governments and citizens have to act together to reduce their risk through all the means we know, physical distancing, avoiding mass gatherings, mask wearing. Mm -hmm. And what we also have is over 100 vaccine candidates that are currently going through clinical testing. There will be results reported next week, which will be very encouraging, um, both from the United Kingdom and indeed from scientists in China who will be reporting on results of potential new vaccines. And th this is the potential hope that we have, that we can control the outbreak through our actions today. And then next year, um, we have the opportunity of developing a vaccine uh, that will be enormously helpful in preventing further pandemics. Right. The vaccines, as you may know, Mr. Horton, uh, actually we have several candidates, as you said, uh, that could be promising. But at the same time, we have also seen research about antibody, uh, which could not last long, which means the vaccine we could have now could only be temporary solutions uh, for uh, some time. So uh, are they going to be efficient? Is there going to be a second wave of deeper research about longer term possibilities? And the honest truth is that, um, remember, we didn't know this virus existed six months ago. So there's a lot that we are learning today yes. about the virus, uh, including uh, how the body responds to it and develops an immune response to it. But think about influenza. Influenza, um, we have got quite used to taking a vaccine every year for influenza um, because there's a different strain that comes through every year. It might mean it's possible that we, if the immunity doesn't last very long, that we might have to have an annual vaccine for this coronavirus. But at the moment, we really don't know. The most important thing is to understand the immune response, to get these vaccine candidates into clinical trials. Um, and although it's a gamble, um, because there's a lot we don't know, I remain confident that over the next 12 months, there will be candidates that will emerge that will be able to be produced for clinical use. If you look at uh, some of the earlier examples, whether it's about HIV AIDS or Zika uh, virus or some of the others in the Africa, we have not seen a vaccine being developed as fast as you suggested about uh, COVID-19. Should we bring inflated hope to our global population. You're right that um, we want to manage expectations of the public. We're not going to have a vaccine this year. Let's be clear, we will not have a vaccine for clinical use this year. And that means that the virus will be in our communities. We have to live with the virus for the time being. That means that we have to manage our own risk. Governments can't do it all. We can't live in lockdown permanently. Otherwise, our economies and livelihoods will just disappear. Yeah. So that means that we have to take responsibility for protecting ourselves. And I think, I think that's the biggest challenge, actually, that societies uh, are facing, to accept 
that they have to, that we have to live with the virus and that we have to change our behaviours. All the things that we took for granted, whether it was going to the office, taking public transport, going out to a restaurant or going to a bar or going for a coffee, these things that we took for granted are changing right now and that is a radical challenge for us. Mr. Horton, I really wonder on the personal note, how are you personally dealing with those challenges? Well, I'm getting, I'm getting used to, uh, <laughs> to, to adapting. So I have my mask, which uh, I carry with me at all times. Okay. Um, and every time I go into a shop or a store, I, I wear it. Um, we're adapting. Uh, and uh, I, I think, you know, one of, one, of the, one of the lessons of this pandemic, and this is a positive lesson, is that we have shown in our country's remarkable solidarity. Um, people have been kinder to one another. People have got closer together with one another. People have listened to one another. I think that our societies, strangely, are stronger today mm -hmm. because of the adversity that we have faced. So I feel optimistic that we will get through this we will change, we will adapt, but we will survive and we will be stronger. China is the only country so far that promised to the international community openly. Once it is really having a successful vaccine, once it can be used on a, a wide basis, it will be a global uh, public good, but we haven't seen that pledge from the other countries, even though Oxford University research team did similar pledge, but that is not from a country. So how shall we understand the possibly once again geopolitical fight uh, likely to follow, even if we could have a successful vaccine? Yeah, I mean, one of my disappointments uh, during the past six months is that at no time have countries been brought together to discuss the global response to the pandemic and how we're going to move forward with treatments or with a vaccine. So I think it's a matter of urgency that the United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, brings countries together at an emergency special session of the United Nations General Assembly to have all 195 member states of the United Nations come together to talk about the global response and to address exactly the issue that you're raising, which is how we can have a fair distribution of the vaccine. The vaccine, when it first becomes available, needs to be distributed to those people most at risk. And that means people on the front line of the pandemic. That's not people like me. It means people who are actually on the front lines, people who are health workers, people who are working in shops with the public, people who are working on public transport, all those who are right on the front line of our society. But that needs to be an agreement between countries, a convention between countries. And the only way that can happen is through countries coming together to agree. Otherwise, we're just going to have a fight and the strongest country will win. And that isn't fair and it isn't right. Mr. Horton, your journal is well known for putting out some of the latest research about uh, the medical field of our human society. We used to be quite proud of what we have achieved over the past few centuries, but this global pandemic seems to be a very uh, much a test of how much we have achieved, how much we have covered so far with science. Uh, one coronavirus already beaten us uh, to some of the biggest mistakes we have ever made in history as well. Yes, I, I mean, this pandemic has held a mirror up to our society. And we have had to look at ourselves in the mirror and we have seen some things about us which are not very attractive. We have many vulnerable populations in our countries who have been at particular risk. People who are older, 
people who are living with chronic disease, those from different ethnic minorities, um, and actually women as well have a particular burden. The, the dangers of domestic violence and domestic abuse have increased under lockdowns. Some of the scars that our society lives with, some of the wounds that our society exposes. And moving forward, we now have an obligation to heal those wounds. How do we build a better society in the future than the one that we have just left? I think this pandemic is the beginning of a new epoch for our species. It gives us the opportunity to write a different story for our future. And I hope that we can collectively, as a collection of nations, work together in solidarity to write that different story. Mm. One lesson of this pandemic is that the world has come together through science and medicine to investigate and find solutions to control this pandemic. And that is a fantastic success story. We're right in the middle of it still, but we have achieved a great deal. So I'm looking forward to a future where we can work closer together in harmony um, and in solidarity. Mm. And that's what I'm looking forward to in the coming months. One of the things you really need to work on, I'm sure you're doing that every day, is to try to find the focus of research. What are some of the most important areas of research that is likely to provide us with new evidence and new solutions? What do you think, what is your judgment, some of these areas that we need to look at closely? I think that the, um, the big question is the one that we just touched on, and that is the vaccine question, because um, we really, really need to understand uh, whether we can have a vaccine in the next 12 months. And, and that, that is really the big global priority today. It's only with a vaccine that we're going to be able to mm. eliminate the virus from our community. I think the, the other issue is, and, and this, I think this is where the story of China becomes very important, actually. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you had your first SARS outbreak in the early 2000s, China was becoming a wealthier country, but you weren't ready to deal with that outbreak. Over the past 20 years, the Chinese government has invested huge amounts of money in health, and in research. And what that meant was that when the pandemic broke out last year, you were ready. It was tough. Mm. It was a challenge. But your health system and your research system were prepared. And it meant that you could swing into action and respond incredibly fast. And the lesson from China's experience over the past 20 years, from SARS in 2002 to another SARS coronavirus in 2019, 2020, is that for other countries, they really have to invest in their health systems mm. and in research, because these are the two foundations that can protect societies. There is another dimension to security, and that is the health security the human security of your population. Mm. So I think the second, the second priority I would urge countries to consider is how they better protect their peoples through health and through science. Mm. Talking about science, which is also an extremely important topic, uh, uh, Mr. Horton, it is no secret you have seen in some countries that some scientists were being labeled as one or the other. Uh, scientists' view were being politicized. Scientists were being uh, tortured by political parties in their rhetorics. And scientists' views and advice coming from scientists collectively may not be listened by policymakers. How do you look at the reality? What you have just described, this beautiful prospect of everybody working together, is that likely to be realized? What the country that I admired greatly because of its scientific talent, the United States of America, 
um, is going through a very strange period in its history. Political climate um, is so strange to understand because you have a government um, led by a president who seems not to respect science. And I think this is the, one of the biggest threats that we face. There is a movement in the world against science. Mm -hmm. And that sense of anti-science um, is a huge danger to the health and well-being of our peoples. Those countries that have taken science seriously and those countries that have acted on the science quickly, those countries have had the most successful responses to the pandemic. But those countries that didn't take science seriously, those countries that were slow and indecisive and complacent and didn't recognize the warnings from scientists, those countries have suffered. And I think one of the lessons to come out of this pandemic mm. is that we need to take science in our societies more seriously. And we need political leaders, we need political leaders who understand the value and power of science to inform their decisions. Richard Horton once again speaking out, the editor-in-chief of The Lancet.